You're listening to the podcast of ASN Kidney News, the news magazine of the nephrology community. ASN Kidney News is a publication of the American Society of Nephrology, the world's largest professional society dedicated to leading the fight against kidney disease. The Renal Support Network is a nonprofit, patient focused, patient run organization that provides non medical services to those affected by chronic kidney disease. In this episode, taped at Renal Week 2009 in San Diego, California, ASN Director of Public Policy Paul Smedberg interviews RSN founder and president Lori Hartwell about her organization, her struggle with kidney disease, and patient concerns such as the reimbursement system for dialysis care. I'm Paul Smedberg, Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the American Society of Nephrology, and today I'm joined by Lori Hartwell. Well, yes, I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, Lori. And Lori is the founder and president of the Renal Support Network. Lori, uh, one thing I learned about you today was that you've been attending Renal Week since 1993. So in addition to hearing a little bit about that, I'd love to hear a little bit about yourself and how you came about founding uh, RSN. Well, I've been a patient since 1968 for over 41 years, and I was diagnosed with hemolytic uremic syndrome at the age of two, probably from E. coli bacteria. And so I've been, I'm basically a professional patient. Um, It's what I know, the kidney community. And I've seen all the advancements throughout the years with kidney disease. And when I started coming to ASN in 93, I was overwhelmed by how much hope there was just to, you know, walk around and see all the people working behind the scenes. And, you know, basically I'm a product of of ASN and all the people who are working behind the scenes. So it was nice to make that connection. And it is really inspiring seeing all the people who do work behind the scenes on the patient's behalf trying to discover the next great thing and kidney disease research, and it's really inspiring, isn't it? Well, I had a Scribner shunt in 1968. We've come a long way <laughs> since the Scribner shunt. And thank goodness, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's exciting because of the immunosuppressant medication and the treatment for kidney disease. I mean, I have this transplant for almost 20 years. I mean, that's miraculous, and it's because people are doing the research and all the hard work and collaborating to find ways to make people who have kidney disease lives better. How did writing the book Chronically Happy change your life? Well, I wrote Chronically Happy because I have a unique experience of having kidney disease at such an early age, so I think I learned how to adapt. And I witnessed a lot of people who didn't really know how to cope with being diagnosed with such a serious illness. So I had learned some really pretty sophisticated coping skills. And I learned that it was easier to be chronically happy instead of chronically pessimistic. And I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned. And it's opened up so many doors because since the publication of the book, I've sold like 15,000 copies. And patients read it, and they want to do what I'm doing. And that gives them hope that they can have a joyful life in spite of kidney disease. And that was the goal because I saw too many patients giving up. And that's what I feel like I'm here for, is to help people and patients not give up. So what was the moment or what was the day that you decided, I have to find an organization to help patients who happen to be living with kidney disease? I had always been involved, but I actually have a particular moment. And I was sitting on Sunset Boulevard in La Cienega in Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) And I was sitting at this light in traffic And I said, you know, I really want to help people who have kidney disease, and how could I help them? And what do they need the most? And I saw a lot of patients dying of loneliness and loss of hope. And that's when I thought, that's where I can fulfill a need, because I know how to help people connect and network, and I also know how to help them feel to see the value in what they've learned with their illness. And you can pour that into advocacy and all the other elements because there's this this wealth of information that a patient has once they've gone through the illness. We just need to figure out how to utilize it. Well, since that day on La Cienega, the Renal Support Network has really grown into quite an organization. I'm looking at a graph right now and all the activities that your organization is involved in. I'm sure you're proud of all of them, but are there a couple that really 
stand out to you as having a broad scope and impact on patients' lives? One of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of as like a baby is that I throw a prom for all the teenagers with kidney disease every year. And that really reminds me how many young people are impacted by this illness and how they're going to have to live a very long time with a difficult illness. So I get a lot of energy from that group. Advocacy, our weekend program, is really important because if patients don't have access to care, then it's going to, it's really hard to have a good quality of life if you don't have the care available for you. We also have a kidney talk show or a podcast, and we like to tell stories. We like to tell patient stories, patient survivor stories, to help them show other patients that they can live a good life. So, you know, we do a lot of patient education meetings. And the Hope Line, which is an 800 number where patients can call and talk to another patient, I mean, all of these things uh, help each other because uh, it is. It's a really difficult illness, and if you don't have the courage to do all the things you need to do, um, you just don't get up and go to dialysis or take your meds, and then they can't have the miracle of all the advancements that come through with kidney disease. (laughs) Now, I hear from people, the one thing that they like about RSN is is the approach they take toward patients, that they don't hold their hand. They empower them to get out there and be who they are and be proactive. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. We're patients helping patients. And I see RSN as a leadership group to help patients understand how they're able to help other patients. And I really think that's a strategy because every person has their unique strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, somebody might like to go speak. Somebody may be better off putting a meeting together. Some might be better just one-on-one on the phone with a patient. You've got to find what particular task a patient is able to do to help another pa- patient and then help develop them. And I've seen some of the patients who come in our network are, you know, they're so afraid to do anything, and now they're like my best speakers, you know? So you just see them blossom, and that's what's really exciting to see that process. Well, I know one thing, talking about empowering patients, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have released a proposed bundled payment rule, which will change the reimbursement for dialysis care in this country. Not so much the delivery system, but the reimbursement system for dialysis care. Do you see any unintended consequences of this bundling of the Medicare payment for ESRD patients? Well, um, in my uh, patient network, we have like a group of patient leaders have really talked about this extensively, and we are concerned. We don't know what it's going to look like, um, how it's going to be implemented, um, if it's going to be if there's enough reimbursement. The fact that they're considering orals in the bundle is very concerning. Um, our co-pays are going to go through the roof. Uh, we didn't have to pay for labs and co-pays in the past. And, you know, will the transplant labs be put into the bundle and will that impact? I mean, there's a million questions. And so, yes, it's fearful because when you don't know what it's going to look like, uh, when it doesn't work, we pay pretty serious consequences. And once you implement a system, it's very hard to change it until you start seeing significant impact for the worse. And then they decide, oh, we got to change it. And that's difficult because, you know, they're my friends. We, you know, this is, <laughs> this is a real world experiment <laughs> and it's um, happening with the patients. So, yes, we are concerned and we just don't know what's going to happen. Do you think the patient community and their loved ones have an idea of what's about to happen come January 1st, 2010? I don't think many patients understand the current reimbursement system. I don't think many professionals understand the current reimbursement system. So we've done a lot of education to just educate them of where we are now and then trying to get them to go to the next level. I mean, uh, my friend uh, Bill says, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're hobbyists that like public policy, we're not lobbyists that, you know, understand this. And it's really difficult to understand and all the case mix adjusters and uh, I understand females are more expensive than males, which I can understand that one. (laughs) (laughs) And why is that? (laughs) We're just more expensive. (laughs) A little more, uh, I won't say that. (laughs) So Lori, tell us, um, you've 
said that you know, you're concerned about the unintended consequences. You recently had an opportunity and a representative speak before CMS at the town hall meeting, which took place in Baltimore. What was the message that you conveyed to CMS at that hearing? Well, we had a couple of different things. Um, we were concerned about the medications and the reimbursement for labs and the fact that they haven't even come up with a list of tests for labs. You know, a lot of different things of, you know, are patients going to be shifted for parathyroidectomies or blood transfusions? Is there going to be this cost shift? And then there's also, they, they put a 47% increase in the first 120 days, which I think was a good intention, but people for under 65 were not Medicare eligible, so you don't get the first 90 day benefit. So we were concerned about that. But most important, we're considered about the quality measures. Um, you know, adequacy and anemia is an important quality measure, but it doesn't tell how we're doing. You can have a K2 or V of 1.2 and a hemoglobin of 10 and be and feel awful. So we're more concerned about the patient, the process, and the patient experience. And how do you measure that? And we've suggested some sleep measures. I mean, we really think sleep is the answer because all of the patients, um, the one thing they have in common, if they're sleeping well, they in turn have a better quality of life. So some, a measure like that would be meaningful to patients. Speaking of quality of life, how can patients help nephrologists provide higher patient care, quality care? Well, I think the patients, number one, need to be as educated as possible. And I think right now we're in a really a struggle because physicians want more time with patients and patients want more time with physicians. And that really is the key for patients doing well, is, is time with healthcare professionals. And a lot of times that's not always available, but so we have to figure other alternatives because it's not easy to just have a brochure or go to a website. You need somebody to really walk you through the process. I believe patients can help that. We help patients with that process. But it's an overwhelming illness, severe lifestyle changes. And again, if it comes back to the patient thinking they don't have a future, you know, they'll just say it's not worth it. And then they don't participate. So there is a lot of responsibility on the patient, but it's also the emotions that patients feel. Right. It's hard to really come to an understanding of all of these things that you have to learn so quickly to survive when you're in the shock, denial, fear, anger stage. And that's a normal process of an illness. Do you think some of the normal process of an illness impacts patient compliance? Definitely. I mean, depression for number one, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've gone through depression. I know other people have gone through depression in different stages. But the key is to, you know, get treatment for it or figure out, um, you know, something you can do to help you cope. And a lot of times it's finding other patients to grieve the illness with and get through it. But if you're in a, in a, a state of depression, you can't learn. <laughs> There's study after study, so you can't absorb what the potassium foods are, and you really just kind of give up, and that's what I saw. we got to help patients not give up. How many times have you visited CMS and advocated on behalf of patients? Well, I've been to CMS probably a half a dozen times and to D.C. every year for several years and several times a year. I know Barry Straub pretty well um, before he became the CMS medical director um, because he was from Northern California. And we would be at meetings together and he was always fascinated by, uh, you know, how long my transplant had lasted. You know, the first question is, what's your creatinine? And, you know, <laughs> uh, what medications are you taking? But we've talked to them about a couple of things that we would like and we continue to keep the dialogue going and try to participate as much as possible. How effective do you think the CMS network system is right now in helping patients? The ESRD network system, I think, does a lot of good in helping watch facilities for quality and, you know, really help with that. I think that it's hard sometimes for patients because there's 18 different networks, and it's just confusing. And I think that there could, that could be done a much more unified way for patients to have one place to go. And we've made those recommendations to CMS. 
and patients need to understand, especially as we move towards bundling, the difference between a grievance and a complaint. And, you know, that's not clear. They're very different processes. And patients are very afraid because if they do have a problem, and sometimes it's just personality, but sometimes it's legitimate. And patients need to have a place where they can go to feel safe because they're advocating for all of us when they're doing that. And it's not always viewed as that. It, that. That has to change when a patient is saying something that they're not comfortable with. That's a form of being an advocate. And, um, you know, they could help prevent a lot of problems in the future. They just need to have a safe environment to do that at. Lori, tell us how important you think it is for people living with kidney disease and people with ESRD to have a set goal or set objectives when they do advocacy? Well, I think one of the things that I've witnessed within the renal community is that, and I had this problem when I tried to join the renal community, there were a lot of little things that I could do as a patient, maybe show up at a, a meeting or a fundraiser, or, but nothing was a program put together where I could really get engaged and involved. And I think that for advocacy to be effective, there always has to be a constant plan of how to get patients involved for year and year and out, and not just one event at a time, but a stream of events. And I see how a lot of professional conferences work. You know, they have one professional conference here and they have another. So if you're in the professional community, there's a lot of things you can get involved in and learn from other people, and you can grow and you become a better leader in the community. That structure doesn't exist in the profession, in the patient community, and that's what RSN is trying to do, build that leadership track so patients can be involved in just moderating a blog on a bulletin, a bulletin board to being a lead advocate at CMS and testifying. You know, wherever you want to go, if that's what you want to do, we'll help you get there. You just have to be willing to do the work be educated, and show up. <laughs> well, that's a really laudable goal. Lori, are you aware of any instance where a private insurer or, say, CMS or one of the networks actually have patients on staff to interact with people with CKD or kidney disease in general? Um, I'm happy to say a couple of networks have hired patients now, which is wonderful. Um, but it's not the norm. You know, I have a lot of patients. We have several patients who work for us. And it's not, sometimes dialysis facilities have a technician working that's a patient. But I'd like to see more of it. I mean, if there's a job opening, to offer it to the patients. Because, <laughs> you know, we need insurance, number one, after three years. <laughs> um, when Medicare runs out, if we get a transplant. And it sends such a powerful message. I know I've been to over... 500 dialysis units throughout this um, the country, and I was a working professional patient. And people were shocked to see that I was a working patient. And so those images are so important to get in front of other patients on a continual basis. And physicians. And physicians. <laughs> and everybody. I mean, it's about rebranding. Lori, other than the proposed rule, are there other issues that you believe should be on the top of anyone's advocacy list? Well, of course, the immunosuppressant drug bill. Um, the lifetime immunosuppressant drug bill is very important to the members of RSN, and I know that the House has adapted the lifetime immunosuppressant uh, bill, but the Senate, we still need some work on it. And hopefully, um, that will happen because, you know, that should be a top priority. I've had friends who've lost their transplants because of not being able to get medication. And it's just, I, I mean, I can't even imagine, but I myself had a window where it was hard for me to get insurance, you know? And especially for younger people, they're not skilled enough to afford their illness. If they're 23, 24 years old and coming off of Medicare with a transplant, you can't get a job. I mean, a lot of people can't get jobs now, but I mean, you can't, you're not even skilled enough. So it really puts people in a situation, and I know people, it makes people apprehensive of getting a transplant. And we just can't lose those valuable organs. And there's a lot happening in that area right there's now. There's a lot and happening. So, so that would be, be a part very tough. The, the bill coming forward. 
And the next thing I think on a global scale would, you know, the pre-existing conditions for health insurance. So people who, you know, are discriminated against because they have a pre-existing condition really is counterproductive to good health. Do you have any tips for how nephrologists can help people with kidney disease thrive? Dr. Richard Fine was my nephrologist for many, many years. And this is probably really simple. But he would come in and he's like, you know what, Lori, someday you're going to write a book. And or he would come in and tell me what was right with me. And I think that for a nephrologist who, you know, we're, we're dealing with so many health issues, that one of the things you can do in addition to giving the bad news is to start off with all the things that are right and then, you know, package it with some of the things that aren't going so well because that will help us have more hope. And I think that that's one of the things that nephrologists can do is to learn how to communicate as best as possible because communication is the key to having a good relationship with the patient. And that is the most important thing because we're, my physician, I've had my phys this physician for over 20 years. So we have very long relationships with our physician. And communication is, I think, the ultimate key to a, a good relationship and good outcomes. So with all the stuff we've talked about today, tell us what's next for RSN. What are you doing? How are you going to grow? What's your plan for the next five years for this organization? Well, my plan is, is to continue to foster and retain and recruit patient leaders, um, to continue to educate them through all our variety of programs that you can you know, see at rsnhope.org. And I think the most important thing that I can do is help tell the patient's story and let other patients tell their stories and just keep creating vehicles to do that. Because if we have a lot of powerful stories of patients who've survived and done well, then other patients will know they can thrive too. Well, you've done a tremendous job the last several years. Your group really has grown in uh, its effectiveness and its reach, and I'm sure you'll obtain those goals as well. Lori, thank you for being with us here today. We really appreciate hearing from you and hope to have you back again soon. Thank you for having me. ASN Kidney News is a publication of the American Society of Nephrology. The ideas and opinions expressed by participants in ASN Kidney News podcasts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the positions of the society. To lead the fight against kidney disease, ASN helps its 11,000 members provide high-quality care to patients, conduct cutting-edge research, and educate the next generations of kidney care professionals. To learn more about ASN or Kidney News, please visit the Society's website at www.asn-online.org. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology.